Britain Street, St. John, New Brunswick. This is a street at war. The smallest children battle with clubs till the blood comes, shout fuck you like a rallying cry, while mothers shriek from doorsteps and windows as though the very names of their young were curses, Brian, Marlene, God damn you, God damn you, or waddle into the street to beat their own with switches, I'll teach you, Brian, I'll teach you, God damn you. On this street, even the dogs would rather fight than eat. I have lived here nine months, and at all that time, I have never once heard a gentle word spoken. I like to tell myself that is only because gentle words are whispered and harsh words shouted. It's good to be here. I'm in trouble, she said to him. That was the first time in history that anyone had ever spoken of me. It was 1932 when she was just 14 years old and men like him worked all day for one stinking daughter. There's quinine, she said. That's bullshit, he told her. Then she cried, and then for a long time, neither of them said anything at all. And then their voices kept rising until they were screaming at each other, and then there was another long silence. And then they began to talk very quietly, and at last he said, Well, I guess we'll just have to make the best of it. While I lay curled up, my heart beating, in the darkness inside her, When did you start to write? Well, I started to write and to think of myself as a writer when I was 11 years old. And uh, it, was, it was largely inspired by reading the, the Bible. I read the, before I was 14, I read the, the entire Bible through three times. And not because I was terribly devout, but because it was practically the only, the only book in the house. And inevitably, almost, I decided that that uh, I would become a prophet. You know, when I when I when I grew up, and so that I would add books to the Bible. You know, ones that began, uh, "Thus spake the Lord God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob unto his servant Alden." And so that then there would be in the Bible, you see, a book of Alden. And uh, I, I'm much more modest now. Everyone in the, in the uh, community thought that I was very weird. Well, I, I actually, when I, and I probably was, but the most painful period for me was a period during my teenage years in which the entire community, everyone I, pretty well everyone I encountered, uh, thought that I was retarded. Uh, some of them were very cruel in consequence of this. Some of them were sympathetic in the way that people are sympathetic towards the retarded. And while that was very painful for me at the time, I'm grateful for it in retrospect because I, I, it's give, I have actually lived through the experience of, of being a retarded child. I know exactly what it's like from the standpoint of, of how you're treated and uh, and how you react to things. What made them think that you were retarded? Well, primarily, I suppose it was simply because I was so different in a community in which there was very little tolerance oh, for difference differences. And, and then also, the, the thing is self-perpetuating. Uh, if people treat you as if you were retarded, you gradually uh, behave in a more and more retarded way. And curiously enough, even things will happen to you uh, which seemingly wouldn't happen to you uh, if, if you weren't 
retarded. You, you, you see what I mean? Uh, and when you find that you're constantly stumbling or that uh, if a bird flies over and if there's droppings that go on your head instead of the person standing next to you, just, just as I've also observed that if people expect you to be, be wise or intelligent, you become wiser and wiser and more and more intelligent. What was your schooling like? Well, I, I, I left school after 37 days in grade five, and I've always regretted that because I've always felt I should have left in grade four. But um, I, and I, and during those five years, I learned literally nothing except how to do long division because I, learned, you know, I taught myself to read and write before I went to school. My oh, father, basically, I, I suppose, uh, would have thought of reading books in a way that uh, some fathers would uh, think of, of uh, you know. Um, well, let me put it this way, that um, I, if I were reading a book when my father came into the house, I automatically hit it. Uh, he would have felt about a book reading son almost exactly the, some, the way that some fathers would have thought about a gay son. So I was, I was a closet reader. I, I wasn't any good at any of the things that he prized as the measure of a man. If he were alive today, he would say that I had never worked a day in my life. I'm sure he would. He raids the refrigerator and reflects on parenthood. Nolan, you maudlin boob, almost blubbering, because two hours ago at the party, your son said, I'll be 15 tomorrow. Can I have a whole pint of beer? Grinning so he could say it was a joke if you took it that way. But he was serious, all right. It's like music sometimes, how serious he can be about small matters, which you're thereby reminded are important. And you hesitated, not because you ever considered refusing, but because you wanted him to know that you too value rituals. But there were only enough cool ones for the guests, so you gave him a warm one. It doesn't matter, he said. It's okay, but of course it did. The right was spoiled by an imperfection, and now he's asleep upstairs, and you're holding open the door of the refrigerator, contemplating a pint ball with no more than two ounces taken from it, and the cap put back so well you need an opener to take it off again, thinking of the petty treason we commit so often against those we love, the confidence games in which parents play their children for suckers. Uh, when you write poetry, are you usually writing about yourself? Oh, I think everybody writes everything about themselves, you know. I mean, I think Charles Darwin, you know, the, the, the origin of species was about himself. You know, I, mean, I, I, you know, I don't think any of us could write anything that wasn't about ourselves just because we, we, we have no way really of knowing what goes on inside anybody else's head. All we can do is sort of imagine what would go on inside our heads if we were we were them. So actually, the, one of the funny aspects of this is that some of the things that readers of my work take to be most autobiographical are in fact least autobiographical. And some of the things which they would take to be completely objective are in fact, oh, autobiographical. You know, for instance, I, I, I would say that in my poem, The Bull Moose, which ostensibly uh, is about the death of a bull moose, that, oh, in many ways, that what I was really writing about was myself, simply using the moose as a symbol. 
where it's quite conceivably, if, if I use a human being in a story which bears some service resemblance to me, uh, it may be a different person altogether. In your poetry and prose, Alden, how much importance does love hold? Oh, love plays enormous uh, importance in all of my poetry and prose. And I think in all good poetry and prose, because I think basically there are only two subjects that any, anyone can write about, and one is love and the other one is death. He sits down on the floor of a school for the retarded. I sit down on the floor of a school for the retarded, a writer of magazine articles accompanying a band that was met at the door by a child in a man's body who asked them, are you the surprise they promised us? It's Ryan's fancy, Dermot on guitar, Fergus on banjo, Dennis on penny whistle. In the eyes of this audience, they're everybody who has ever appeared on TV. I've been telling lies to a boy who cried because his favorite detective hadn't come with us. I said he had sent his love. And no, I didn't think he'd mind if I signed his name to a scrap of paper. When the boy took it, he said, nobody will ever get this away from me. In the voice more hopeless than defiant of one accustomed to finding that his hiding places have been discovered, used to having objects snatched out of his hands. Weeks from now, I'll send him another autograph, this one genuine, genuine in the sense of having been signed by somebody on the same payroll as the star. Then I'll feel less ashamed. Now everyone is singing old MacDonald had a farm. And I don't know what to do about the young woman. I call her a woman because she's 25 at least, but think of her as a little girl. She plays that part so well, having known no other. About the young woman who sits down beside me and, as if it were the most natural thing in the world, rests her head on my shoulder. It's nine o'clock in the morning, not an hour for music. And at the best of times, I'm uncomfortable in situations where I'm ignorant of the accepted etiquette. It's one thing to jump a fence, quite another thing to blunder into one in the dark. I look around me for a teacher to whom to smile out my distress. They're all busy elsewhere. Hold me, she whispers, hold me. I put my arm around her. Hold me tighter. I do, and she snuggles closer. I half expect someone in authority to grab her or me. I can imagine this being remembered forever as the time the sex-crazed writer publicly fondled the poor retarded girl. Hold me, she says again. What does it matter what anybody thinks? I put my other arm around her, rest my chin in her hair, thinking of children, real children, and of how they say it, hold me. And of a patient in a geriatric ward I once heard crying out to his mother dead for half a century. I'm frightened, hold me. And of a boy soldier screaming it on the beach at Dieppe. Of Nelson in Hardy's arms. Of Frida gripping Lawrence's ankle until he sailed off in his ship of death. It's what we all want in the end, to be held, merely to be held. To be kissed, not necessarily with the lips, for every touching is a kind of kiss. Yes, it's what we all want in the end. Not to be worshipped, not to be admired, not to be famous, not to be feared, perhaps not even to be loved, but simply to be held. She hugs me now, this retarded woman, and I hug her. We are brother and sister, father and daughter, mother and son, husband and wife. We are lovers. We are two human beings huddled together for a little while by the fire in the Ice Age 200,000 years ago.
Why do you think it's so frightening to think of being truly alone? Well, in a sense, we are all of us uh, truly uh, 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 alone uh, and utterly and, and permanently uh, alone. And really, uh, our association with other people is just a sort of merciful uh, way that God has given us of momentarily concealing that fact from, from ourselves. Do you believe in life after death? Uh, well, it, 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 it's, it's so open to semantics, the whole question of life after death, because in a sense, everything lives after, after death, you know. It's uh, just as in my poem, uh, you know, a pinch or two or dust. That in that dust, there is the blood, you know, of my ancestors, and the flowers grow from that dust. Those flowers are part of the body of my ancestors. But of course, that conception of life after death isn't any great comfort to anyone. The only way in which I've really ever found it possible is, you know, to leave in a self-conscious life after death, is in a kind of shadow world, which perhaps wouldn't be all that pleasant. You know, uh, uh, a world in which perhaps you don't even know that you're, that you're dead. Can you talk about the cancer that you had and how it influenced your work and your life in general? Well, I had a small lump in my neck, which I was inclined to ignore because my family tradition is that you only go to the doctor when you have to be carried there. You never walk to a doctor. But my wife insisted that I go, and there wasn't an, an examination. And one day the doctor called me in and told me you have cancer. and. Uh, um, while you would never dare, I, I suppose, put this in, in a play or a film, uh, what I actually did was burst up laughing. And I, I didn't burst up laughing because I thought it was terribly funny. If you really had cancer, but I mean, the idea of me having it struck me as ludicrous, you see. So that was my uh, initial, initial reaction. And, and then eventually I oh, underwent three surgical operations, and then radiology or treatment. In the operating room, the anesthetist is singing, Michael, row the boat ashore, hallelujah. And I am astonished his arms are so hairy. Thick, red, curly hair like little coppery ferns growing out of his flesh from wrist to shoulder. I would like to reach up and touch the hairy arm of the anesthetist, because it may be the last living thing I will ever see, and I am glad it is not white and hairless. But if I reached up and wound a few wisps of his hair around my forefinger, as I would like to do, they would think their drugs had made me silly and might remember and laugh if I live. So I concentrate very hard on the song the anesthetist is singing. The River Jordan is muddy and cold, hallelujah. And soon everything is dark and nothing matters. And when I try to reach up and touch the hair, which I think of now as little jets of fire, I discovered they've strapped my arms to the table. The odds Oh, statistically, with each particular operation, 
were exactly the same as if I landed at the app three times. And so I, uh, which I would have much preferred to have done, incidentally, because then I could have had a whole string of ribbons here. But, uh, uh, no, well, no, well, I mean, I, I didn't expect not to survive, but I knew there was a chance that I wouldn't, you know, so, I mean, I did all the things you do under such circumstances. Chose my polar bears, left instructions for my funeral. I tend to divide my poems into daytime poems and nighttime poems, and this is one of my nighttime poems. There is a horrible wing to the hotel. There is a horrible wing to the hotel. Unspeakable things happen there. The toilets are plugged. There's excrement on the floors and urine in the bathtubs. In one room, I saw a dog eating a kitten. And people live there, like that young man with muscular arms who mistook me for a thief and would have beaten me with a club, except that I refused to fight back, knowing that he was so much stronger that it would be no use. We became friends, he and I, and there was a boy who stole two small triangular pieces of copper or bronze from the young man's room and gave them to me. I think they may once have been attached to a trophy. I hid them when the young man came looking for them because I was afraid of being beaten and watched him beat the boy. But one night on the roof, we released balloons in the shape of little animals. There was a bear, for instance, and a giraffe, which was bright red, and a blue rhinoceros. They flew very high, those balloons, and I am afraid of heights. Yet I watched them like everybody else, and they vanished into that enormous, spinning funnel of blackness. They flew very high and fast, and I have never seen anything that looked so free. were mercifully able to put death out of our minds. Uh, I probably oh, find it harder than most people, and I, I, I think that, that it's probably a very healthy thing to think about death. Uh, I think that far from being a morbid thing, uh, if I were one of these people like the Maharishi or, or one of these people, and instead of suggesting that people sit down and meditate, I would suggest that they sit down each day and think about their own death for 5, 10, or 15 minutes. And I think they'd be much happier during the rest of the day and probably much kinder to the people around them. The bull moose. Down from the purple mist of trees on the mountain, Lurching through forests of white spruce and cedar, stumbling through tamarack swamps, came the bull moose to be stopped at last by a pole-fenced pasture. Too tired to turn, or perhaps aware there was no place left to go, he stood with the cattle, they setting the musk of death, seeing his great head like the ritual mask of a blood god, moved to the other end of the field and waited. The neighbors heard of it, and by afternoon cars lined the road. The children teased him with all their switches, and he gazed at them like an old, tolerant collie. The women asked if he could have escaped from a fair. The oldest man in the parish remembered seeing a gelded moose yoked with an ox for plowing. The young man snickered and tried to pour beer down his throat while their girlfriends took their pictures. And the bull moose let them stroke his tick-ravaged flanks, let them pry open his jaws with bottles, let a giggling girl plant a little purple cap of thistles on his head. When the wardens came, everyone agreed it was a shame to shoot anything so shaggy and cuddlesome. He looked like the kind of pet women put to bed with their sons, so they held their fire. But just as the sun dropped in the river, 
The bull moose gathered his strength like a scaffold king, straightened and lifted his horns, so that even the wardens backed away as they raised their rifles. When he roared, people ran to their cars. All the young men leaned on their automobile horns as he toppled. If you could have it all over again, would you pick your joys outside literature? If I, if I had unlimited choices? Yeah. Yeah, if, if, I, if I had unlimited choices, I would go back to a daydream that I had when I was a very small boy, and that was uh, to be a king. I even, as a very small boy, uh, well, I, I read a book about William Walker, an American who in the 19th century went down and captured Nicaragua and made himself president. So it seemed there was a certain precedent for taking over Nicaragua. And I visualized myself as finding, you know, six good men and taking over Nicaragua and becoming King Alden I. I even sent away somewhere for a book, Spanish self-taught, so I know the language by the time I got there. You see, I, I wasn't impractical enough to think I'd take over France or some big country, but I thought I might become king of Nicaragua. So yeah, I, I would be, if, if I had unlimited uh, choices, I would be uh, a king of, preferably of some country where, there, where I had a certain amount of power, but where there wasn't a constant risk of being assassinated. 